expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Live Today Live. I'm Randy Robinson here on a messy, icy Texas day for us. I know the rest of you guys in other parts of the country are like, yeah, no big deal. But our office is closed today, uh, and so it's me and the security guard. Uh, but I wanted to be here and uh, bring you some encouragement. Uh, and we're going to talk about something important today. I, I have someone with me who has a book uh, that's been out a short time. It looks just like this. It's called Living Reconciled. And so what we're talking about today is conflict, difficult relationships. Uh, and so the perfect title, uh, I have the executive director and CEO of Peacemaker Ministries. I mean, it doesn't get any more you know, on point than that. So his name is Brian Noble. He's with me. And the thing about these difficult relationships is that we all, we all have them, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have any, maybe you are the difficult relationship. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just speculating, but it's something you got to deal with. And there are things you can do to make life better. You can't resolve yeah. all conflicts, but you can come to peace with yourself and we're going to, we're going to walk you through it. Brian, great to have you on Life Today Live. Hey, great to be here today. Thank you very much. All right. So I, I, the obvious question is, uh, did you write this because you've had to work through these difficult relationships? Absolutely. I've had a lot of difficult relationships. Um, my wife, uh, when I haven't taught peacemaking enough, says, hey, go out and teach peacemaking. Makes me a, makes you a better husband. You know. So I know at that point I should write a book or do something that to, to develop myself and strengthen my skills. So yeah, I've I've lived it in, in either in my marriage, uh, have been the difficult person, or um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody, Judy's asking me about the weather. It's it's we're snowed in. The office is closed, Judy. Um, but I'm here because uh, this is important. We have to learn how to resolve conflict. All right. So, um, where do we even start with this? I mean, do we start with the root of the conflicts, or I mean, what do you think the the thing is, is it just people? I mean, we're, we're people living, working together and worshiping together and we're all different. And so we just naturally have conflict or is it, is it just that simple or is it more complex? Well, I think that that because of the fallenness of sin, if you really think about it, we have a tendency to default to our preferences oftentimes mm -hmm. and make our preferences mandates, right? So when, when we think of like James chapter four, what causes fights and quarrels among you. It's your desires inside of you that are battling. Mm. And so um, we have a tendency to do that very quickly as humans. And then, and then we we take our preference or sometimes it's even biblical stuff and we're like, hey, you have to do it this way. And then we end up in conflict or tension. So sometimes it's th that level. And sometimes we're just kind of stupid about life and we don't even think about how we're hurting others or influencing others. And so yeah. I think it could be on all different levels, uh, depending on the relationship. Yeah, I, uh, I know. For, for me, um, a lot of it's just personalities. Like I would do it this way because I think that works better or works better for me. Or as someone else I know, they would do it a completely different way because it works better for them. And it's almost like, well, neither of you are wrong. Uh, right. And, you know, not necessarily one's better than the other even. It's just, it's just different. And that can actually create conflict. Uh, I'm guessing you've been absolutely. in that position more than once too. Oh, absolutely. When you think about how our personalities can be, um, contrast each other. I mean, it makes life colorful. It makes life exciting and exuberant, but it's not always pleasant, right? Because, uh, <laughs> especially when, when you want to go in a direction and it just seems not to be there, maybe someone's more risk adverse and someone's more, right. um, able to embrace risk. Yep. I mean, all that comes in to play as as we look at these difficult relationships that we can find ourselves in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't be an Uber driver, I, I because that is where I get in most conflict with with my wife, at least, uh, is is when I'm driving, because <laughs> I don't drive the same way she does, uh, and right. obviously her way is better and slower. Right. But anyway, mm. how how do we start to untangle? these difficult relationships um walk us through some of these steps because we're going to see ourselves in all of these yeah i think the first thing um we have to understand the state in which we're in or the place in which we're in and so in chapter one i really talk about that this world that we're living in is a fallen world like i, I think we've kind of taught 
ourselves, maybe the next generation, like conflict or tension in our life shouldn't be there. But the reality is it's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's there for all of us, whether you come from like, I was raised in a divorced family with stepchildren and blended family situation, or, you know, there, there can be that family dynamic or you show up at church and guess what? There's tension there. There's the music's too loud. The music's too quiet the You know, I mean, and so it's, it's because of the fallenness of this world that we don't uh, specifically have peace every single place we go. And so normalizing it is very important um, to understand that this is a, this is a fallen world. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a starting point. I, I like to say we're not in heaven yet. We're also not in hell right now. We're in the battle zone. Yeah, we are. Yeah. And I, I do, think, do think it's important to, to notice that if you don't have peace with someone, it's not always because of their sin. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. it, it could be some shortcomings on your own. How often do we tend to, I don't know, do we put it on others maybe too much? Is a little introspection warranted here? Well, I'm a firm believer that no one can control the tension in your life. You have your own control over that. Mm. Um, and when you look at some of the most horrendous things throughout history, um, take like the Holocaust or something like and there's two people who went through the same or very similar experiences, but they come out of that 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 horrible situation in in a totally different way, right? I mean, they one comes out better, the other one comes out better, right? I mean, and and what was the difference? It's a lot of it has to do with our attitude, our perspective, how much we allow others to uh, have control over our emotions. So I think it's a lot of introspection, you know, I think it's a lot of knowing your identity in Christ and, and all those things. Um, it's easy. I think in my marriage, like I, I like to say for my first four years on in marriage, it were hell on earth. It was like, I thought if Tanya wasn't like me, that's my wife. Um, it would be, um, I, I gotta fix it. I gotta fix it. I gotta fix it. And as I've gotten, you know, tw year 25 now, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, wow, guess what? I'm not trying to create Tanya into my image. Mm -hmm. I'm allowing, allowing her to be who she is and let God create her, her into his image and, and, and vice versa. She's doing the same for me. But um, I just think it's so uh, fundamental of that, that looking inside and seeing where control and power and all that comes in. And our attitude is a big, big part of that. No doubt. And I think anybody that's been married, we, I'm at uh I had to stop and think 31 years now. Um, okay. You have to do that at some point uh, because I mean, that's, that's the closest and most difficult relationship for most people um, is, is marriage. But once we start to do that, you, you, you come to a place of peace <laughs> right. appropriately um, and you can reconcile the differences. What are some of the, the steps you think that people can walk through to get to a place of peace or reconciliation? Well, it, the book, the premise of what I wrote on was from Philippians uh, chapter two, verse four was the launching pad to go into second Corinthians five. So starting at that Philippians spot, it says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, that although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. And so he says, I want you to have the same attitude of humility as you jump in, mm. um, in, into life, an attitude of, you know, you you are a humble person who's going to live out through the gospel. So then with that lens, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5, and the first thing that I really think is powerful is that we begin to get an eternal perspective. Um, and that idea of this isn't going to be forever. I tell, I tell couples, you're both Christ followers. You're going to have more days whole and complete than you will ever have in this fallen world. You know, when you think about, I've been married 25 years and you put that up against, and you 31 <laughs> against eternity, that's just a drop in the bucket, mm. you know? So getting that eternal perspective, um, I tell the story a lot about like my daughter who's disabled, never walked, never talked. Mm. And I can either look at her being in a wheelchair with a trach, a G-tube on life support several times and say, okay, that's, I got to fight for the here and now, or I can set that disability in eternity and say, you know what, I'm going to hear her talk more, dance more in the presence of Jesus than I ever will have in this fallen world. So I think that's a very Im important um, concept as we think about our tough relationships to realize we're not in eternity yet and that we'll have more days with them. So shifting just a touch, because 
you, you bring up your daughter, that actually can make your relationship with God difficult. Um, it can. How have you? Um, how have you walked through that? Because, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. So I, I like to say my first when when she, she's 20 now. So I always have to be careful when I tell the story because there's people who are just starting the process of, of grieving and loss. Yeah. And, and, and my first uh, seven years of dealing with her disability, um, if I, you know, I usually talk about those being the angry years. Right. Um, and, and it was really, really difficult um, to embrace that. Um, I, I tend to come from a background that really believes, you know, hey, you pray, God heals, mm. it touches, you know, and then the disappointment of of, of not seeing those actions. Mm -hmm. um, and and then um, so that grieving process took place. And then and then as I began to embrace and and this is why I'm so passionate about eternity. I remember sitting in my car one day complaining to God that I'll never walk my daughter down the aisle right. at, a, at a, you know, on a wedding day. Right. And the thought went through my mind, but Brian, you get to walk your daughter down to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And my perspective began to shift. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, man, for those people who have perfect lives, heaven's going to be boring. But for the rest of us, <laughs> it's going to be a sweet, sweet spot, you know, because we're going to see the fullness of God. And and so uh, the, the anger turned into joy. And now I truly can say she's 20 years old. So again, if you're just starting that process, Give yourself time, give yourself grace to work through it. I'm not, you know, um, but I can truly say, like, I look at her with joy um, and I don't look at the disability as much as I used to. Now, there's days that it's annoying, quite, you know, quite frankly, and it's inconvenient and it's everything else. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we don't have our days, but it doesn't seem to be as long of a season as it was at the very beginning. But how about, did that create some conflict between you and God? Oh yeah, those those first uh, seven years, I was upset and Just tried to be a pastor and be upset at God. Right? Yeah. No, I know. I raised. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and if you add that, I'm a uh, you know I come from I come from a, a more expressive background. Tried to be that, and uh, sometimes I I would joke, and this is a joke. I'm maybe sometimes joking isn't good, but I'd say I'd rather be Baptist in this moment because I'd have <laughs> less expectations, you know. And that's a joke, of course, but. Um, <laughs> But my idea was, you know, I live, I, I, I'm operating in this, this faith-based community. And it's like, how do I reconcile all that stuff and not see what I, I believe that the scriptures have, have called us to? And here's the number one thing I learned. If I remove the element of time, those promises become true. Because mm -hmm. when you remove that element of time, you begin to understand that God is good. And so I had to begin to proclaim God's goodness above my circumstances. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so yeah, I wrestled with it. I'm not, I mean, it took me a lot of years of trying to figure it out. I mean, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's important to be honest about. There's no shame in it. Uh, right. And, and God do, does reconcile the relationship um, and it brings you to a better place. So I appreciate you being open and, and candid yeah. about that, that that's important for people, especially that are going through it. Uh, this is the book living reconciled. Uh, it's by Brian Noble. And um, <laughs> well, there's a few things, a few steps in your book, um, and we talk about several of them. But I, you know, obvious one is to you know not live just for yourself. I think that's good. But I think another one that you bring up that is a little less obvious is you, you talk about not recognizing people according to the flesh, which has a nice biblical ring to it, um, but it's a little abstract. What what is that? What does it look like? It is so. When you when you look at the scripture, um, therefore he says in in Second uh, Corinthians five sixteen. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. So Paul Paul writes this, mm -hmm. and when you think of it from a practical standpoint, I can either say, well, you know, Tanya did this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. My wife, and, and really look at her according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. Or I can do what Paul encourage, encourages Iodia and Syntyche in Philippians chapter 4 that says, hey, whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is right, dwell and think on these things, right? right? So we are not victims of our thinking. We're not victims of every thought and, and disappointment that flies through our body. We really have control over that. And so, 
starting to look at a person according to the way that God looks at them. Mm. And this is why it's our, I'm talking about our attitude. Um, by taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ, we really begin to um, be able to look at someone from a different perspective. And it takes prayer. It takes commitment. It takes <laughs> it takes time to change it. Because if you just let your mind run, run wild, at least I'll just say it this way more personal. If I just let my mm-hmm. mind run wild, it's easy for me to point out the demon and the, 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 you know, all this stuff that, that, you know, and by the end of the day, I can say, well, that person doesn't even love Jesus, you know, because I just see all of their fallenness. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, I can't tell, tell you how many cases that Peacemaker Ministries has helped in where people come in and question the salvation of the other person <laughs> simply because that's all they see is their fallenness. Uh, wow. Well, that's good. I like that. I like that. Uh, another, you, you call these courageous attitudes. Um, yeah. Why do you think it requires some courage to change, you know, in order to get to peace? You know, I guess I think the idea of fighting courage and fighting to get to peace is, is uh, there's a little, uh, ah, it's not a little tension there, I think. Right. Yeah. There's like a jumbo shrimp moment there. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> An oxymoron. So I, I agree. And I wrote this book more like a coach to a player, right? So um, it takes, like, if, if the player's on, uh, you know, playing basketball and the coach is yelling, you got this, you're going to make the basket. We want the, we want the player to begin to, the basketball player to begin to say, I got this, I can make the basket. So I wrote it from more that direction. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I put the word courage there is because, quite frankly, if I'm going to be controlled by Christ's love, it's going to take courage. Yeah. Um, in marriage and you know i'm now a grandpa so my my oldest son is married and has a kid <laughs> it's going to take courage to have to be controlled by that uh love uh to to look at you know whatever with my other kids whatever situation i'm going through to 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 say you know what i i am courageously coming to a point where i look at this in a different view and i think our culture is missing courage right now and so that's one of the reasons why I used it. We got to be co- courageous individuals. Yeah, yeah, um, no doubt. I tell you, one of the more uh, difficult things that does require courage uh, is, is when you have uh, a difficult relationship with someone who's not a Christian. Mm. And so you're on different footings to begin with, uh, different mm. values, um, different goals, oftentimes, and if, especially if you're in like a work situation with someone like that, um, that takes a complete adjustment. And I think you touch on that when you talk about understanding that you have a ministry, right? How can making a relationship, a ministry, and by that, I don't mean, uh, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to proselytize. I'm going to, you know, throw Bible verses at you until you hate me kind of attitude. (laughs) What is the right kind of ministry in that situation? Well, in a, I say it's a funny, but really in a non-funny way, is sometimes when we think, well, someone's not a believer, I, I, I mean, it's almost like we have this attitude, I can treat them worse, right? <laughs> and we, we kind of match, you know, we match what we're experiencing. And I just don't see that to be the gospel, right? <laughs> I actually saw Jesus teaching, treating the religious leaders, I mean, I don't want to say worse, but you know what I mean. He right, was, right. he's saying, you brood of vipers. I mean, he didn't call any sinner that, you know, right. I mean, um, you know, he, he called sinners to repentance. He said, stop sinning, but he, he drank water with them. He ate dinner with them. He talked to them. He told them, you know, parables. And so I don't know. I, I think that sometimes we re- invert that or reverse that. Yeah. And it's really a gospel opportunity. And I would just challenge people to, as much as they're complaining about that, maybe abrupt boss that they have, who's not a believer, Maybe they, maybe we should try praying for them as much, and not praying that God changes them, fixes them, but God changes us and fixes us so that we can model through how we live, um, live out the gospel. So, uh oh, uh oh, it's really a, it, it's a modeling. You, you pr- pray that God would change us and not the sinner. That's a that's a courageous prayer. Uh, it is, yeah, and that's one that'll have some some impact. What about the situations where, no matter what I do there's no peace. Uh, do, do you, you know, I know we can be too quick to shake the dust off our feet and make it sound spiritual and justified. Uh, but realistically, there's some situations you, I, I don't know, we may not ever reconcile. 
how do you what's the attitude yeah. we should take in, in those cases i think it's important that we separate out reconciliation which is based upon the cross and reinstatement of relationship mm. so on this side of heaven there is things where people abuse other people right there's domestic violence those are real extreme situations there's violence there's those kind of things and god actually answers in his word what we are to do in those situations is to have the courageous attitude in ourselves where we we embrace god's peace not peace with the actions but peace with the gospel right peace with god mm -hmm. and let god be the judge of that and if we really understand that god is not just a gigantic santa claus teddy bear up in heaven that he's a just God and he's holy, um, we can then embrace like scripture in Romans 12, where it says, if possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. But the next verse is leave room for the wrath of God. Hmm. Right. If you hmm. go to that next verse, it says, hey, let God be the judge and remove. So we remove our, our judgmental attitude towards them. And we say, God, this injustice that I just experienced, I'm, I'm not going to be on that judgment seat. I'm going to give that over to you and you're the judge. And I guarantee this, he will be much more just than you will ever be. So, okay. Now that that's a big statement right there, because I've struggled with that in the past where it's like, you know, it, it's not right. You know, it's not right. And, and it was like, at some point the, the thought or the still small voice, you know, said, right. do you trust my justice more than your own? Right. Do we we kind of have to if you think about it and we're fools not to yeah because sometimes what happens is we begin to think like god's just going to wink at sin yeah and that's because currently in our culture we've taken one attribute of god god is love which he is i'm not i'm not disputing that but we've overemphasized it so that it distorts the whole mirror yeah right <laughs> it's like the you know like the fun houses when you grow up that makes you look really tall, makes you look really fat, makes you look really whatever. Um, those fun houses that you go into with those different mirrors. Um, well, yeah, God is love. Equally, God is just. And you can't distort the image of God because, it, well, I guess you can, right. but we shouldn't distort the image of God um, because then it doesn't allow us to process through those moments of extreme injustice. Yeah, no doubt. I stand by the mirror that makes you look skinny. <laughs> but I bet myself. <laughs> uh, so once we start to consciously walk through this path of reconciliation, being at peace, uh, you know, with the difficult relationships, um, how do we move to the point where we are a reconciler and helping others? Because that to me is like the pro level, right? Yeah, it is. It is the pro level. So I know that when you have an authentic uh, experience of God transforming your heart, um, that something happens inside of you that, quite frankly, that is very attractive to people. And it's not in a, um, they just say, man, they went through that and this is how they came out. I want to know about that. Mm. And that, that testimony, if we use old language, right, becomes um, a story that people can relate to because you're authentic, you're real, and you can begin to comfort people with the same comfort that God just comforted you. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to have that ministry of reconciliation. I mean, the fact is, is that I, I like to tell people we're not special. Like, there's Brian has a disabled child, but you know what? There's a million other people or however, I don't know the numbers, but there's a lot of people who have disabled children. And someone went through a divorce. There's lots of people who went through divorce. I mean, so we take whatever it is mm -hmm. and we understand the reconciliation that God has done. Then we can begin to minister to the body of Christ uh, as God provides opportunity to to share that story and and there will be opportunity i promise there will be <laughs> right this wide open field how did you get into this having you know peace here i should show people the, the website here let me do this real quick there's uh peacemaker ministries.org um and yep. and that's brian's uh how how did you get into that what made you think i'm going to be the peacemaker guy well 
Um, about 20 years ago, when I was uh, a lead pastor in a smaller church, I split the church. <laughs> on purpose or on accident? Well, it was on accident. It was poor leadership. And, uh, you know, we, we had taken the church and grew it from, I don't know, 30 people to a few hundred people. And I split it. And so I was like, God, there's got to be a better way. And so I'm not the founder of Peacemaker Ministries. It was actually founded by Ken Sandy. Yeah. And so I, I, um, I researched. I mean, the internet was pretty new back then. Uh, and I researched. And actually, um, I don't know if you remember H.B. London, pastor to pastor. He used to send out cassette tapes. <laughs> but anyways, I got a cassette tape. I put it in there. And uh, here, here was uh, uh, our founder of Peacemaker Ministries uh, being interviewed. And I'm like, I got to meet this guy. Hmm. And, um, and so I, I met Ken and said, I want to learn this stuff. Yeah. I just went through this horrible church experience. And that was simultaneous, the years of being, you know, finding out about my da daughter's disability and being angry at God. I mean, that all happened at the same time. Wow. And so God started healing my relationship with my wife, healing my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should put that in another order. Um, and, and then learning how I took another church in, in North Idaho and I, I brought peacemaking to it and I learned how to heal the relationship within the church. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> that's how I got involved. <laughs> Trial by fire. I mean, it yeah, was, yeah. yeah. No. And, and, and so you're not just talking the talk in the book, uh, you're, you've walked the walk and, and I'm guessing, well, I mean, what, what, how much better is it to be a peacemaker than to be a church splitter? Yeah, I know. Well, I love it. And, and and I think sometimes people think of peacemaking, they really think of peace faking, like, well, that means that you just don't ever tell the truth, or you just kind of keep your opinions to yourself. It's soft. If, yeah. if you know me, you know that, well, hopefully, I speak enough truth that it's clear and enough love that it's palatable. That's my goal, yeah. right? I yeah. want it to be clear and palatable. And, and humble, I want you to, I want to have an ounce of I could be wrong in this situation. Um, but I, I'm I'm typically described as fairly blunt, um, but with compassion, and so. Ooh, I like that blunt with compassion because you know we have this squishy view of peacemakers. It's almost mm -hmm. an insult, or at least right. viewed as soft. I mean, we'll right. celebrate these, but oh, they're, oh, they're, they're the peacemaker. It's almost. Like, but you're right. It takes courage. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it takes confrontation. Uh, it, does. it takes clarity. It's not actually an easy thing. So what people don't realize is like when Jesus was overturning the tables in the temple, he was still a peacemaker in that moment. How so? Well, he never sat down or put aside any of the fruits of the Holy Spirit or his character. He didn't stop being God right. at any point, <laughs> at any point, period, okay. let alone when he turned over the tables. And so what we'd like to do is use those. Actually, there's five. There's five. You can do a case study on this. There's five times in the scripture where it describes Jesus as becoming indignant. Huh. And at those very moments, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control uh, yeah. were still there. Yeah. So that means every table he turned over, he did it intentionally. Wow. He was still a peacemaker. I've... Versus when I'm angry, yeah. I don't turn over tables, but you know what I mean? It's not self-control. Yeah, no, honest, honest God, I've never thought about it that way because... Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I've never turned over a table in self-control either. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> if I ever got to that point, it was because right. it was it was a total loss of self-control. So that's an interesting right. thing. I, I, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna chew on that one for a while. That's good. All yeah. Right. So he did set. I mean, he was fully man and fully God. He didn't set aside. I mean, because he was sinless. So we know at the end of the day when they describe him, that experience at the temple, or like when when the. Um, the, the uh, disciples try to keep kids from coming to him. Mm -hmm. It says Jesus became indignant. Now we don't know anything more than those those couple words there, whatever that means. Yeah, and he he taught a lesson. Um, so I don't know. He just never set aside being God no, no, in those yeah. moments. No, of, of course. But I don't. I never thought about it until you said it like that. So that's good. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, all right. Well, this this is good. Uh, you guys check out the book. Um, it's called Living Reconciled. You can pick it up wherever you pick up books. Uh, you can check out the uh, the website at uh, 
peacemakerministries.org. Is there anything else you want to add? Anything? I'll give you the last word before I let you go. I appreciate your time, by the way. Oh, no problem. I would also say check out our app. It actually has a button that says Start Navigating Conflict. It's like I'm sitting next to you asking you questions. If both people in the conflict have the um, have the app, it guides them through a conversational approach to biblical reconciliation. Um, a, a recon- you have a reconciliation app. Yeah, it's called Peacemaker Ministries. Search for it in the Google Play or Apple App Store. You'll see the little symbol, like the handshaking behind me. Yeah. Um, and you just click, let's navigate conflict. And it says simple conflict or complex conflict. <laughs> and it walks you through. Yeah. I, I love that. I was, I, I've never heard of that. That is awesome. So, yeah, check that out. You yeah. might need that. Great, man. Again, you thank it. you. Go You're ahead. welcome. Go ahead. No, I said you might need it. Yeah. Oh, well. Guarantee you <laughs> at some point. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Unless you're holed up in a cave somewhere uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as the uh, hermit. Yeah, yeah you're going to need it. So that's great. Thanks again, Brian. I appreciate appreciate the insight, appreciate the conversation uh, and, and, and your time. And uh, peace be with you. Yeah. Peace be with you. And with you. <laughs> and with you. Thank you. All right. Uh, appreciate you guys out there hanging out. Oh, I didn't have my music calm. Let's see. There's some music. All right. Uh, the book looks like that. The website looks like that. And uh, more great em- interviews this week. Well, tomorrow. You'll have to come back and see what that looks like. Appreciate you being here. See you again next time on Life Today Live.